everyone. Welcome back to Hate Read Podcast. I'm Anna. And I'm Em. Every fortnight here on Hate Read, one of us chooses a book we think the other will hate, and then we try to read that book and we talk about it. Uh, this fortnight, I challenged Anna to read Annie's Baby, The Diary of Anonymous, A Pregnant Teenager, which is theoretically by Anonymous, <laughs> but is actually by Beatrice Sparks, PhD. Uh, so mm-hmm. first things first, Anna, did you finish the book? <sighs> yes, yes, <laughs> I, I did finish this book. I am sad to say that I did not throw it down in anger halfway through, oh, it was so but bad. instead barreled on until the end. <laughs> on the one hand, this book was a great book for hate reading. Well, and it, it's it's the quote unquote found diary of a fourteen, a real fourteen year old girl who really mm-hmm. went through this teenage pregnancy. But she's trying. She wrote the fucking thing. She's trying to pass it off as completely yeah. real and non fictional account. Now, but she made all this shit up. Here's here's the thing with Beatrice Sparks because I you know researched her before doing this episode and then also like after reading this book because i was like what the fuck is going on um Mm -hmm. so she we talked about this last episode she wrote or she published the book go ask alice which is like a very famous found diary anonymous book about drug usage which was published in the 70s i think um and it's the same sort of over the top really ridiculous uh reactionary type of text and she wrote a bunch of other books that are similar in that they're found diaries. The only one that might have actually been a real diary is this one called like Jay's journal, which supposedly Mm -hmm. this family read, go ask Alice and gave her Mm -hmm. their son's diary after he had committed suicide. And she went through and published it. And of the like 200 some entries that he had, she only used 21 and fabricated a bunch of stuff about how oh. he was into Satanism oh and this God. and that. So they were not happy <sighs> about it. Um, so that's... Oh, yeah, I can't imagine why. Yeah, so that's the Ugh. one instance where... And even that, I'm kind of skeptical that that really... Ha- like, any of that really happened because I feel so unsure of anything after... Like, I don't trust anything about Beatrice Sparks <laughs> at this point. No. So I don't even know no, for hundred percent that that really did happen, but that's the only instance where like a family has come forward and said, yeah, this was our kid. Cause most of them end with the kid hmm. dying. And this I think is mm-hmm. one of the few. Oh, that, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them it's like sad, 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 depressing drug stuff. And then at the end it's like three weeks after this diary was finished. So-and-so died of an overdose. Uh, yeah, so of course there can't be a, an author to come forward because they're supposedly dead. But you would think someone's family would come forward and be like, hey, maybe don't capitalize on my child's yeah. death to push your moralistic <laughs> propaganda. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. No, this this Beatrice Sparks, definitely. She has an agenda. Um, yeah. And it's pretty clear what she thinks about <laughs> just, She just, I don't know. She's just like that worst kind of like middle-aged preachy woman who thinks her values are more important than everybody else's and yeah uh so i guess we should kind of talk about what this book is actually about yeah do you want to kick us off yeah we can go ahead and get started on that i suppose so the book was like just shy of it was like around 250 pages right um but the summary is not very complex because a lot of it is just typical teenager well (laughs) a facsimile of typical teenager whining in her diary about things. <laughs> uh, so I will give the synopsis that I can. So Annie, the main character of this book, she's a 14-year-old girl who is, I would say, pretty popular, pretty pretty, um, likes to play sports, one of those tomboy goody two-shoe kind of girls. The story starts with her meeting this boy on the soccer field and he just comes up to her and is like i need a friend and (laughs) for some reason that just really does it for annie she's like oh he needs a friend i love him and she becomes obsessed with him literally this guy comes up to annie and is like hi friend bye friend like and i'm just like why (laughs) what is this who but Annie is just into it. She's instantly, like, creaming her pants over this guy and his social awkwardness. Yes, and he's, like, 
here's what he says to her. He says, I'm new here and I'm looking for a friend, a sort of not embarrassed to be, he snickered, sweaty, sporty sort of friend. Like, <laughs> is that really so what the 14 year olds so go in these days? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> if you're a 14 year old, let us know. Yeah, please tweet at us the last pickup tweet line you us. heard let as a 14 year old. <laughs> So, so she like kind of stalks him for a week, but um, she doesn't really. They don't really interact again for for another week. When suddenly he like comes up and finds her again, and I guess they sort of start dating. Um, it's kind of unclear the timeline of their relationship because, um, spoiler alert, it's an abusive relationship, and so there's a lot of um breakup manipulation used on Danny's part where he. Yeah. leaves her or threatens to leave her and ignores her if she does things he doesn't approve of. They start dating and as the relationship goes along, he, like, he, he starts out like kind of sweet, although really, I don't know, like creepy sweet, you know? like He starts out, this is one of the things he says to her. He says, hi, fellow sports nut. You look yummy and nummy out of your wrinkled, yes. sweaty uniform. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which... <laughs> I mean, again, <laughs> that really gets my engine going. Mm, yummy <laughs> and <you>? nummy. <laughs> yummy and nummy. So yummy and nummy. And he calls her, he calls her his earth angel. Yes, which what does that even a, mean? Is a reference, to, well, it's a reference to a song, which oh, I don't think these song? kids would, I think it's from, hold on, let me look it up so I don't sound stupid. I think it's from, like, the 50s, but I'm not sure. This book was published in 1998, I think, too, so, like, yeah, there's a lot of outdated ideas and thoughts just from that itself, but, let's see, Earth mm-hmm. Angel. Oh, is it that movie from Back to the Future? Marvin Berry and the Starlights. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, it was in released in 1954, so it's a song mm-hmm. from 1954, which became popular, I guess, in... Uh, the 80s what the 80s and i guess i'm looking at um i guess it was used in some films in the 90s Hmm. there was a 91 film named after it but again i just don't think that's a reference that 14 year olds in 98 would be like or i guess he's 16 uh the teenagers in the late 90s would be like clinging on to that reference i don't know it was weird but yeah the main thing that was weird about it was that every time she writes it in her diary she writes it in quotes and capitals and i'm like why are you why are you formatting it that way that's so bizarre i know like uh, i don't know it was really really reminiscent of screechy teenage girls (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but so okay so they start off and it seems Like, it would be okay, but of course this is not the way the novel goes. So the relationship quickly turns super abusive, where he starts hitting Annie. Um, He's very emotionally manipulative. He makes her, you know, get rid of all her old friends and dress a certain way and cut her hair a certain way. Makes her start drinking at parties. And then, to top it all off, he attempts to rape her on several occasions. Which is, you know. And when she doesn't go along with it, he gives up calling me a boob mama's baby. Yeah. Which <laughs> it's great because she keeps referencing how there's so much gutter language in this crowd, but it's anytime there's a quote from Danny, it's usually he calls her a boob. Yeah. And I'm like, why? <laughs> that's... Which, and I okay. guess that's the other thing about Annie we haven't mentioned yet is like, she's very religious in a very like non-specific way. <laughs> yeah (laughs) she she mentions going to like a methodist summer camp Mm -hmm. um with her friends but also says like i'm not methodist because mom says that you can as long as you are thinking the right thoughts it doesn't matter exactly what religion you follow which is pretty forward or not forward uh pretty progressive thinking i guess yeah also like i don't understand then why annie is so gung-ho about her religion and so focused on it um, it seems like to be the very guiding principle of her entire life, but we never really get any impression from her mom that her life is supposed to be. She's it, It's like Beatrice Sparks wanted to include religion mm-hmm. because of reasons, and she also didn't want to alienate any little Christian kids who are reading this 
by picking a specific religion. So again, right. it's very it's very um propaganda esque in that by not choosing a specific religion for Annie to be involved in when she has all of these religious feelings and thoughts Mm -hmm. sparks is just trying to make her appeal to a wider audience Mm -hmm. um she's trying to be an every girl which she isn't at all but whatever whereas if she was a specific you know if if we heard about how she goes to this church or that church or she does this thing or that thing or whatever it would kind of make her seem more fleshed out more realistic Mm -hmm. but it it would maybe be off-putting for some 14 year old reading it being like oh well i'm not Catholic, I'm Baptist, you know? Yeah, yeah. Like, it was purposefully and overtly done so that purposefully any teenage omitted. girl... Purposefully Yeah, so any teenage girl could put herself into Annie's shoes and be like, you're right, I yeah. won't ever have sex ever, because sex is awful and and only kids going to hell have sex. Right. So. Cool. <laughs> and then, okay, so this is the part of the book where I got really upset and didn't want to continue reading. <laughs> because... <laughs> Danny and Annie. Wow, I just realized their names together, Danny and Annie. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah. Um, they do start a sexual relationship um, that begins because Danny tricks Annie into going to his home while no one else is there. And he forces himself on her and later convinces her it was her fault because she was doing like kind of a fun little teasing dance with a scarf, which was, you know, I mean... I, she's 14. I can't imagine it was anything too sexy. She's 14 and has never, like, done anything with a boy before. So, like, <laughs> I don't think that – well, whatever. I mean, obviously, that wasn't was an excuse for him to do what he did. But that's what he tells her. And she totally buys it. She's like, yep, it was my fault. And I'm nothing without you. And I'm so sorry that I made you rape me. And please let us stay together forever because we're in love. Yeah, it's it's – really painful to read Mm -hmm. and it's also just very okay it's very unrealistic in we've we've kind of touched on the ridiculous things danny says and it continues in this scene where they're hanging out and danny it says that he laughed throughout his arms and yelled dance for me wench which (laughs) nobody talks like that and that's what kicks off this scene like that's our intro to this scene Mm -hmm. and then it goes into this and again, he just keeps saying these ridiculous things that don't sound like any teenager in the 90s would ever say these things. Mm-hmm. And it's very discombobulating because it's this terrible scene. But you're also kind of like, I wasn't laughing about it, but it was so confusing because I kept going, what? Why is this 16 year old saying, you know, he's saying wench. He's saying, yeah. you know, you're being a baby boob tube, like go home and cry to your mommy. Like, I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. This, and then just, I felt like it was so over the top in, yeah, right, where Beatrice, again, because it's freaking propaganda, Beatrice Sparks wanted us as the reader to not blame, well, she made Danny like comically over the top villainous in this scene, Mm -hmm. which obviously, if you're committing sexual assault or rape on someone, you're a terrible person, but at the same time, Mm -hmm. there's no nuance in this like it's it's like it's like she read a book or she she saw a checklist of do is your spouse abusive or is your significant other abusive um if you select seven or more of these items then yes you're in an abusive relationship but it's like she put like all 15 or whatever into one person yeah yeah exactly yes and then none of because that's the thing about abusive relationships is that there's good times for sometimes Mm -hmm. even the majority of it is good or seems good and then that makes you forget about the bad times but there is nothing Mm -hmm. redeeming about danny in this book at all like annie keeps talking about how he's this great guy and how he's so wonderful but none of that is ever shown he's just terrible from the beginning to the end so it's it's like of course this guy is abusive annie he all he's ever doing is abusing you there's never there's never that like okay i get why she's hooked on him moment and again, I don't want to sit here and be like, yeah, Annie's an idiot for not breaking up with him. But in mm-hmm. this context, she's kind of an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I there's I, she sees it as her personal goal in life to like purify Danny's life 
And she thinks that she is his moral compass and that the only way he will ever get better is if she stays with him forever to show him the way to the light and to the Lord, yeah. I'm assuming. Um, but it's just, there's, there's maybe like two scenes where he's nice to her. And I just can't imagine that that would be enough for, to keep a 14 year old girl. Well, I don't know. It's been so long since I've been 14. Maybe his looks were enough or the fact that he could drive a car. I don't know. Um, which brings me to another thing is he is a 16 year old in the same grade as Annie, who is 14 because he got held back a year. Yeah. And they're Um, both in seventh grade, I think, which. No, that can't be. I was like 12 in seventh grade. Right. Well, I think that, I think they're seventh or eighth grade. Cause I know at one point she talks to, and I think, I'm not sure. This is going to be very boring for all of our non-American <laughs> listeners. Um, but okay. So like the way my school was set up was uh, like most high schools are set up where mm-hmm. your last four years are high school. So freshman, junior, senior, or freshman, sophomore, nine junior, senior. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So nine through 12. Uh, and then before that, you're in a separate school. Mm-hmm. But I think it's implied that their school is middle school, is seventh through ninth. Mm, that's what my school was. Yeah. So I think that I'm not sure. Is he actually in the same grade or is he a grade above her? I don't. That's a good question because she does say at one point that he's going to go away to the high school building the next year. Yeah. And she was. Yeah. Had some sort of emotion about that that I can't remember. <laughs> so, yeah, for him to be 16. So 15. I don't know. If she's 14 in September and he's 16 in September, that's like at least a couple grades he'd have to be held back to still be in the junior high school with her, not just one. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think that she's supposed to be eighth grade and he's supposed Mm -hmm. to be ninth grade and that Mm -hmm. their school is split seven through nine after nine. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, which was how my high school and junior high were. But but yeah. so anyway, I guess back to the point is like, but since when is like, and this is going to sound really super mean, but I'm like get really getting into the, the 90s teenager mindset here with this. Since when is the kid who got held back a year the coolest kid in school <laughs> <laughs> that everyone wants to hang out with? I mean. I mean, sure, he's got a car. But... If he has a car, I think. I think that might be the factor, that he has a car. And also he's rich, so he probably buys oh, everybody that's drugs. that's true. Because that seems to be the implication of his group, is that they're all smoking dope and getting high all the time. Which, yeah, um, and that's the other weird thing. And so, okay, so he he himself is 16. That means his whole, like, posse of friends is also, like, 14 or 15 years old and, like, He's yeah. just their weird ringleader, and all the teachers love him, and apparently the lunch lady brought him in chocolate chip cookies one day. Just, like, everybody loves this guy. Well, he's he's on the football team, and we all know that that means the middle school football team. You have a lot of social clubs. Of class. course he's the star of the middle school football team. He's 16 right, he's years 16. old. He's too old. He's, like, two feet taller than everybody else. <laughs> he's had way more puberty to go through than those other boys. <laughs> Oh my god just picture picture like a sixth grader even on this team like a, you know some middle yeah. schools go sixth grade uh so picture like a sixth grader on this team a 12 year old just like year looking old. up at him like god and you know he's like just tackling all the littlest kids too he doesn't give a shit yes absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So I guess after the after after the big um, rape scene, then Danny ignores Annie. Like he makes her walk home, the thirty one blocks from from his apartment to hers or wherever his his mansion to her apartment, um, and then he just ignores her for however long until she begs him to take her back, and they resume a regular sexual relationship. Um, in which Danny refuses to use protection. And so he gets one of his friends to get her the birth control pill um, so that he can have all the unprotected sex he likes. Which, of course, Annie's 14 and doesn't understand. I don't know what the deal with that was, like, underground black market birth control. Well, then I was even thinking, like, was it even really birth control or was it just all the sugar pills? Probably not. (laughs) It's probably just yeah. sugar pills. <laughs> I mean, she wouldn't know any better. She she doesn't understand right. the importance of taking it every day, which because she skips 
her prescription a lot. Well, not even her prescription. She skips the pill. Her sugar pills. Yeah, her sugar pills um, frequently enough that she does end up getting pregnant. Which is a big shocker. The book is called Annie's Baby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a decent way into the book, which also kind of was frustrating reading the first third of this mm-hmm. book because I'm like, okay, we know you're you're going to get knocked up. When is When is that happening? It's like a foregone conclusion. So there's all this yeah. conflict and drama around, you know, the sexual relationship. But the title of the book is Annie's Baby, the, Di- the Diary of an Anonymous Pregnant Teenager. So we kind of know what's <laughs> going to happen here. There's not really... You kind of gave it away with that one, Sparksy. Yep, yep. <laughs> there was no tension at all, except for the rage I felt at every right, character in this which book. Which is just a very uncomfortable way to read, to be sitting there going, oh, when is this 14-year-old going to get knocked up? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not, totally that's not how you want to approach a book. <laughs> I want to get to the juicy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> When's her life going to be ruined? <laughs> That's what we're all here for. I hope she cries some more. Hear about how she gets her life turned around. (laughs) So Annie sits on this secret for probably a couple weeks or no, even maybe longer than that. I don't know. She notices her for two months in a row that her period, she's just spotting. She's not having an actual period. And so she finally goes to get the pregnancy test. Yes, she's pregnant. And she keeps it a secret and then finally goes to tell Danny about this. And he is, of course, completely enraged and denies that it could be his because it, what's he say? It could belong to, that baby could belong to anyone. Hold on, let me find the quote because it's horrendous. Oh, can we just read this whole, can we just do a reenactment of this whole scene with one of us reading as Danny and one of us reading as Annie? Can that be? Okay. (laughs) Uh, on page 108 is where it starts. Okay, hold on. Here it is. You want to be Danny or Annie? Oh, God, I don't want to be Danny. He's a dick. I'll be Danny. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you ready? You ready? Yes. Okay. So we are going to reenact the scene for you in which <laughs> Danny and Annie have a conversation about her being pregnant. Uh, lead up to this, they're getting in a little, they get in a little scuffle and Danny starts off. You shouldn't have done that. Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this line. <laughs> I'm not a bitch. I'm, I'm the mother of your unborn child. <laughs> no way. <laughs> he hissed. <laughs> How do you hiss that? There's no s's. Snow sway. <laughs> Snow sway. <laughs> We've got to talk this out calmly and sanely. There's nothing to talk about. There is too. I'm... I know what you are. You're a dirty, careless, quote, ho, unquote. (laughs) And then the, (laughs) the text says, He slapped me so hard across the face, I could hear the bones in my neck crack, but I held my ground. Ugh, whatever. I've been your girlfriend, and I'm pregnant. You've got to help me decide, in italics, what to do about it. Your little bastard could be any guy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best line This is the, the best line world. of this book. You guys ready? Your little bastard could be any guy in town's good time slime. <laughs> good time slime! <laughs> such a good that is such a good that is such a good word for semen (laughs) good time slime (laughs) good time slime which again it's just so it's so inappropriate in this conversation i know like i I love when i i love when i stumble across new euphemisms for for words (laughs) such as good time slime but like yeah, you're right. In this context, it's totally appropriate to be laughing at that. He's beating also... up his girlfriend, but he's, he's using beating... the phrase good time slime. What am I supposed to do? I can't not laugh at that. <laughs> it really breaks the tension. I think that's why she included it. Things were getting too serious. Too with heated. Danny hitting her that he uh, had a Too thing. heated with the beating up of the pregnant yep. teenager. Yep. Anyway, Danny's not into the whole... 
responsibility thing. Uh, yeah, and so Annie asked him if they can get married. <laughs> Which, You really want to sure. be trapped to this guy for the rest of your life? Yes, he's wonderful <laughs> and perfect and thinks she's an earth angel. <laughs> earth angel. And he calls her a, a duh head. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm 16 years old, duh head. <laughs> And you think I'm going to stifle my life for you and your slimy little bastard? <laughs> to me, you're just another piece of poor white trash flesh trying to flush the rich kid down the toilet with you. Like, Which really brings up the classism that's present in this book as well. I which think. is all over the place. Just all over and the place. And it just gets worse that the further Annie gets along in her troubles, the worse her classism gets. It Yes. <laughs> It's so bizarre. It's so bizarre because, oh my gosh, it's, I can't, the, I can't get, we, the, uh, uh, well, uh, we'll get there when we talk about Tammy because there's so much I have to say about poor Tammy. Yes. Yes. So Tammy and some of the other girls in uh, Maria. Right. Yeah. Anyway. So after Danny is, um, the most unsupported person in the world about this, Annie finally decides it's time to tell her mom about the baby. And guess mm. what? Her mom is, like, really cool about it. She's like, hey, we'll just take it one day at a time, and w w I'll help you through this, and we'll be okay. Which, I mean, I guess I don't know how else you could react to your... Well, I, I know how else you could react, but, like, that that was, seemed a little too chill to me. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, not even, like, wait, hold on, you're 14. Yeah. You're 14, and you're you're pregnant? You're What? Hold on. Yeah, there wasn't a single, Give me a sec. where did I go wrong? Yeah, her mom's just like, this is totally yeah. cool. I'm a chill mom. Like, okay, cool. I'm the cool single mom. Yeah. I was voted uh, best high school teacher in the state or whatever, so <laughs> you know. That's a, that's a fact that Annie brags about her mother on more than one occasion, unnecessarily. <laughs> um, so she tells her mom, and later in the book it's revealed that Annie's mom did go to Danny and Danny's dad to discuss the pregnancy. But they either Danny does or I don't know if his dad is involved with this or not, but they basically blackmail Annie and her mom into silence by saying they'll ruin Annie's reputation. Um, Which, like, get a lawyer. And get a that the whole lawyer. football team. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure you should probably still call the police. That's like, <laughs> don't just, like, back off from that. Right. Like, you should call the police about the whole, you know rape thing which regardless mm -hmm. of if of if you can get a conviction on the actual like rape rape part you can definitely get a conviction mm -hmm. on the whole statutory thing because mm -hmm. you've got the dna evidence so yeah yeah who, at that point who cares what he says that's the thing they say that if she gets a dna test they will tell the whole town that everybody on the football team slept with her which Mm -hmm. If she gets a DNA test, she's going to have pretty good proof that it's Danny's kid. So who cares if they tell the whole town this or that because it's a DNA exactly. test. Like, I don't understand the logic. <laughs> it's a fucking DNA test. It doesn't yeah. matter what they say about, mm -hmm. oh, she slept with the whole football team. Especially considering uh, throughout her pregnancy, Annie kind of gets more and more ostracized by society anyway so honestly at this point who cares what society thinks of her fuck them like they're being dicks anyway yeah so who cares if she thinks exactly if they think she boned the whole football team get that kid in trouble for statutory and get him on a child support payment plan this is ridiculous yes this is so ridiculous yes. this entire thing annie goes through absolute hell in in her life and mm -hmm. her 14 year old life and danny gets off scot-free yeah like whole book he, there are no repercussions whatsoever None. no one ever which like yeah and i get it that life's unfair and you know things don't always work out the way we want them to but considering that this is not actually non-fiction like come on beatrix sparks. right beatrix, what is her name beatrice beatrix sparks b sparks b sparks sparksy yeah come on dr b self insert oh yeah right um, <laughs> you got that too yeah <laughs> um yeah you could have you could have had something happen so yeah so that's cool so annie's mom is basically like oh what could i do against a popular boy and his rich dad i guess nothing so i'll take three jobs to help pay for this kid right which also why the fuck didn't they call annie's father and be like hey you need to send us some more money are you giving us child support? I don't know. This book makes it very unclear. Yeah. Because literally, I think the only thing that her father 
helps her with it all. Because her father lives off in a cabin in the woods with his own mother, which I don't know. There was some backstory there that yeah, was Yeah, living off missing. her social security or something. Yeah. So he, the only sort of support or interaction they have in this entire book, which covers over a year of time, is he sends her a stroller. And that's it. Yeah. And it's not, yeah, it's not discussed at all. Like, she's not like, oh, it's weird that my dad hasn't called to see how his grandchild is yeah. doing. And well, and he's not concerned that his 14 year old daughter got pregnant. Right. He's just not there. There was like a line later on in the book, like almost a throwaway line, where she says something about how her mom used to let her go to Sunday school as a kid. Yeah. And then her dad made them stop. And she goes, well, maybe my childhood wasn't as normal as I thought it was. So yeah. I'm kind of starting to think that maybe her mom was also in an abusive relationship with, with Annie's dad. And yeah, I don't know. There was something going on there. Well, cause early in the book, there's that whole section about where she's talking about how she wants to support Danny because of this and that. And she says something mm. like, Oh, mm-hmm. if my mom was more supportive of my father, maybe they wouldn't have gotten a divorce. Maybe oh. this wouldn't have happened. So it seems like there <laughs> might be some parallels there that she thought oh her mom wasn't being supportive of her dad when really it was that her dad was an abusive asshole i'm not really sure but yeah. there's some weirdness going on in the backstory that's never really talked about yeah someone needs to sit down with annie and tell her what healthy relationship looks like right. because she really has no idea yeah mm. so annie i don't think she goes back to her regular school she was going to a private school where danny was um, but her mom decides to enroll her in a school for unwed pregnant teen moms, question yep. mark, that's yep. in a um, a building that was condemned, but they cleaned up part of it to make it available as a school building, <laughs> which sounds super awesome. Um, and <laughs> it's run by a woman who was previously also a a pregnant teen and uh, she's turned the her life around. Counselor. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So they have a counselor that comes in twice a week and talks to them about what it's like being a pregnant teen and blah 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 blah, and what resources they have out there for them and things like that. Which, and this begins the <sighs> <laughs> Annie's tirade against the poor. Um, so <laughs> she, <laughs> the school is like strangely divided in annie's words into like the the naive goody two-shoe girls who are like we just made one mistake but we still want to be successful and and make things make lives for ourselves and the worldly i don't want to i don't want to say like just the worldly girls who kind of got around and maybe this wasn't their first rodeo and apparently just want to are desperate to get on welfare so that they can get their own apartments and not have to live with their families ever again and have their babies with them and annie just cannot understand their mindset and because she wants to be independent and go to college and i (laughs) just this and i think i think it is um something that should certainly be noted that kind of the main girl who is one of these welfare wannabes is Mm -hmm. um in a book full of tammies and annies and dannies uh her name happens to be (laughs) lolanita so you guys can take from that what you want there's definitely no you can racial overtones here definitely not definitely not that's not what's happening. <laughs> like, seriously, fuck you, Beatrice. Yes, yeah, like this whole, like, just the way that she demonizes people who could possibly need a little bit of extra help to get yes. on with their lives. And I don't think we super want to get into the politics of it all, but it's very, like, obvious um, who Beatrix, Beatrice, who B. Sparks probably voted for. <laughs> and it's so hypocritical because Annie... You're 14 slash 15, and you aren't paying for shit. Mm -hmm. The only reason... Your mom is working three jobs to support you. The only reason that this is working for you at all is because your mom is able to work all of these jobs. And she's so entitled about it, too. She's Mm -hmm. like, I wish my mom could stay home more. And I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe your mom could stay home more if there was more government programs that helped out teenage mothers. Maybe that's that's a thing, maybe. You know, maybe maybe you should take a look at some of some of the options that are available to you instead of just yeah. shitting all over it constantly. Uh, yeah, she's got a 
And even when she tries to make attempts to to reach out and understand this other group of girls, so like Tammy, she kind of um, is disdainful of Tammy mm-hmm. at first because she thinks she's real dumb because Tammy doesn't know how to read. Um, but they kind of connect when she sees Tammy. She like, I guess Tammy has attempt suicide. Yeah. Um, and she by by ingesting a lot of over the counter meds and stuff, but it is in the process of like trying to reverse that as Annie stumbles across her in the bathroom and she kind of like cleans Tammy up a little bit and um gets her back on her feet and gets going and and they bond and become friends and you're like wow that's great maybe now Annie will see that things on the other side are not as bad as she's imagining them to be well no because (laughs) she makes it her goal to uh raise Tammy's station in life I guess you could say and is very disparaging of everything about Tammy um, so the first thing that she says about her best friend, Tammy, she's not very pretty. In fact, she's not pretty at all. So it's no wonder that she fell for the first guy who came along and gave her some attention. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> Annie, look at you. Look at yourself. Look at your life. Look at your choices. <laughs> uh, yeah. But then we find out later uh. that Tammy actually could be pretty if she had, like, money and could buy nice clothes and hair products and things like that. Mm-hmm. Because her and her mom give her a little makeover. Yes. So then so then she makes it her goal to, like, enroll Tammy in beauty school so that she can always right. be this pretty. <laughs> right. <laughs> what? And Tammy's Did just... Did anyone ask Tammy? Uh, Tammy seems game. Tammy's... <laughs> <laughs> Tammy's happy to cling on to any shred of attention anyone gives her yeah. because she's she's described as like um her home life is essentially her parents have too many kids and are on welfare. Mm-hmm. So so she she and and Annie says her family's nice enough, but they're screamers. Oh and yeah, and the house is real dirty. Their house is so like mm-hmm. no baby should ever have to live in a house like that. Right, right, <laughs> girl. <laughs> Check your uh, privilege. Yeah. And <laughs> and even after, so, like, Tammy has her baby first before Annie does. <laughs> Annie goes over to, like, see the baby, and she says about it, Oh, dear God in heaven, I pray my baby won't be so pathetic. Because, like everything else in Tammy's life, her baby is ugly. <laughs> Just, oh, man. Annie, even when we want to root for you, you are You're the making it really dick. hard. You're making it really hard, I Annie. I swear to God. Ugh. Yes, there was nothing redeemable. As, and again, we're not trying to victim blame Annie and say that it is her fault that she got into this mess, but there is nothing likable about this girl. <laughs> like, there's anything, nothing it's... redeeming about her. There's no reason for you to want to root for her. <laughs> she's, she's just, just terrible. Brat. She's just the worst. Yes. She's such, she's such a brat. She, like, the moment that she kind of decides that she's gonna be okay earlier in the book, when she's coming to terms with this, she's like, oh, well, you know, it's all gonna be okay, because soon I'll have a baby to love and cuddle and snuggle with, and it'll be my best friend. And I'm like, who thinks that? Who's like, oh, yeah, babies are just gonna be Mm. easy, easy peasy, and they'll be my friend. Like, that's not a good reason to have a baby. She thought the adults were exaggerating about how bad it would be. Right. It's it'll be super easy for her, this mm-hmm. fourteen year old. Of course, because she's perfect. Why wouldn't she, right. Why wouldn't anything come easily to her? She's all, so it's almost like she's willfully ignorant about the hardships of pregnancy and like child rearing. Because even um, after Tammy has mm-hmm. her baby, she starts telling her about, oh, you know this this is what the birth was like, and this and this and this happened. And in her diary, Annie writes, oh. I can't, I don't even want to think about what she said after that. I'm not even going to think about it. It's terrible. And I don't like, no, you should probably yes. listen to what your friend who's going through a very similar thing to you is saying about this thing you're going to go through yes. in a few months so that you're like prepared instead of just she, covering your ears and going, no, 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 I can't hear you. Yes. And she even says like, this whole, this whole birthing thing is unnatural. Like, how do you think you came to be, Annie? Like, well, I think I think she might be talking about maybe like um, the painkillers and stuff, and like the hospital part of it, because she says something about, "Oh, I don't even want to think about the epidural or something like that." I'm just like, why would that's why would that be the thing you don't want to think about? That's so weird. Yeah, she just doesn't. She just doesn't understand. 
She's just a dumb 14-year-old kid. Maybe that was my problem. She's just, <laughs> she's just 14. Reading her diary, she does not sound like she is 14. She sounds like she is a failing actress from the 1920s. Like a former uh, s- silent movie actress who the talkies oh co- have God. come along and she's no longer employable. That's who she, what she sounds like. Wrong generation. <laughs> She's just an old soul. Oh, dearest friend in the world, Daisy, I'm so glad I have you. I want to talk to someone. I need to talk to someone. I've got to talk to someone. But I'm so embarrassed, so humiliated, so hurt. I mean hurt both (laughs) physically and mentally, as well as emotionally. I don't think I'll ever recover. I don't see how, how I can. It's like a hideous nightmare. Like... Just constantly. Everything she says, it's very, uh, it's so over the top, and she doesn't sound like a child. She doesn't sound like someone born in this century. No. (laughs) No. uh, Uh, She's, her, everything about her, and and by the way, she calls her Diary Daisy. Oh, um, yeah. And the diary, like, talks back to her. (laughs) We haven't even, which is, it. (laughs) It's completely unnecessary. It doesn't affect the plot at all. It's just kind no, of no. randomly there occasionally where there will be quotes around something mm-hmm. in the diary and it's supposedly the diary responding to her. Mm-hmm. Why? She's just going crazy. She's going crazy. This book is a lot better if you just assume this is a horcrux situation. And um, oh, yeah, like it's, it's Tom actually Riddle. a diary that talks back to her and is sitting there. Going like, oh my god, this kid is so fucking stupid. Oh my, I need to help her. So- girl, <laughs> girl, get your life together. And then like, there's like long periods of time where the diary doesn't talk back. And uh, <laughs> you just, the diary's just sitting there like, I can't, I can't with this bitch anymore. I can't even. <laughs> I can't even. She needs, I, I don't want to hear it. Please stop. Oh, man, I wish this diary led her to the Chamber of Secrets and helped her <laughs> revive the Dark Lord. That would have been a much better book. Been a way better book. <laughs> so, the baby's born at seven months, and Annie quickly develops a pretty bad case of postpartum depression, as I'm sure you can imagine. She doesn't want the child. She's frustrated with the child. She thinks the child is ruining her life. And at one point, she decides it's a good idea to try and abandon her child outside of a, like, really expensive, like, pottery barn kids sort of (laughs) store in full view of like a bunch of witnesses she just (laughs) she leaves the baby there in front of the store and sneaks away to hide behind a bush and this woman like finds this baby in the stroller and is like oh dear and assumably calls the police she leaves the baby there because she sees the woman and she saw the woman earlier be like giggling over a child or something was amused by a child and so she's like this woman clearly wants to be a mother. I'll abandon my baby and she will adopt it. And this is definitely the best way to go about this for sure. I will do her this favor. So she like mm-hmm. leaves the baby there and then, you know, bush thing and then comes back. Yes. And is like, shit, where's my baby? Yes. And the police find her and pick her up for questioning. And of course they are of the mindset that she purposefully abandoned this baby and I think are ready to probably get CPS involved in everything, child protective services involved in everything. But Annie makes up this terrible <laughs> lie about how she had to vomit and poop really bad. <laughs> this like, is the one moment of the story that I liked, Annie. I was like, <laughs> yes, girl. They're not going to question that one. <laughs> she she goes into this really long, descriptive, like disgusting story about how she had to vomit really badly. So she hid behind the bush <laughs> and as she was vomiting had a bad case of diarrhea and then had to run to the ladies' room to deal with the very messy diarrhea issue. Like, man, if this book was just more of Annie antics, where her, her uh, way of getting out of things was making stuff up about how she had to shit, like, that would be such a better book. <laughs> be so into it. I'd read that book Forget this times. baby stuff. <laughs> more capers. <laughs> <laughs> but and and somehow the plan works and the police are like okay have your baby back and they drop her off at home <laughs> which i guess brings us to the next section where she starts to receive therapy for her postpartum depression and i don't know 
the book is not clear on who first notices that she's having these issues or who encourages her to seek out help. But she is entered into a group therapy where she at first like is very disdainful of all these other women who have had the very exact same thoughts that she's had about her baby, <laughs> like to the letter. And she's like, Oh, I would never think those things about my baby. I'm like, you just did. You just did for like 30 pages. I would never want to smother my baby with a blanket in a random, re- in a public restroom, except for that yeah. time that I wanted to smother my baby with a blanket in a public restroom. I mean, yeah. except for that. Or I would never yell and scream and emotionally abuse my baby, except for all those times I tell it to shut up very angrily while it's doing a baby thing, <laughs> crying. God. So <laughs> so I guess it takes a few of these sessions for her to finally admit that she also is having these issues. She breaks down in group therapy and cries about it, and everyone is very happy and helps her work through a small part of her problems. And then the rest of her mental health treatment is taken care of by one of her mom's distant relatives who is a psychiatrist named Dr. B. <laughs> who do we think that could be? I, <laughs> Certainly I not no the clue. author. No, that's not possible. <laughs> so she goes and spends a couple days at the psychiatrist's house, which I guess Dr. B assumes is enough for Annie to make a miraculous recovery. Um <laughs> And they have these long conversations where Annie can finally admit that she was never in love with Danny and Danny never loved her and that he was very abusive. And I think this is actually the first time that she admits to anyone about a lot of the physical abuse Danny put her through. Um, She still hasn't, I don't, by the end of the book, I don't think she's even told her mom yet about these things. And she tells her therapist that she is going to remain celibate for the rest of her life now because of this. And her doctor's <laughs> like, okay, I support that. Like, what? What? That That's also not healthy. <laughs> Whatever. Your body, your choices, girl. But that is not – that shouldn't be the main takeaway from your experiences. <laughs> but the fact that, like, the psychiatrist and therefore – the author like endorsed that point of view there's also just "Hmm." a whole bunch of like info dump in this section where they literally include like a checklist of abusive relationships with like the little boxes and everything yeah the checklist that was entirely danny and they start just like dr b just starts (laughs) spouting off statistics (laughs) in this book like uh, like which incidentally got to one of my there were several stats in this book that were incorrect, but the mm-hmm. one or misleadingly presented, which the one that annoyed me the most was um, they keep talking about, oh, teenage pregnancies, teenage pregnancies, this and that. And then she's like, oh, the National Center for Disease Control is saying that out of wedlock birth rate has doubled and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And trying to relate it to. The, and I'm like, yes, obviously. Or it's like a, a square rectangle situation. Mm hmm. All teenage pregnancies are most likely out of wedlock pregnancies. Yeah, but that does yeah. not mean that all out of wedlock pregnancies are teenage pregnancies. So this is this is a different statistic <laughs> than the thing you're talking about. Why do you keep bringing this up? Yes, the the rate of out of wedlock births has increased, but that doesn't reflect that doesn't necessarily reflect the rate of teenage pregnancies and also speaks more to the fact that just more people are not getting married than they were in the 50s, you know? Like it, it's it's not germane to this conversation. It doesn't affect this conversation about teenage pregnancy. <laughs> Abstinence until marriage. Ugh. And to top it all off, there's like all these supplemental notes at the end of the book where um, that Dr. Dr. B. Sparks has uh, thrown in there just for shits and giggles, I guess. And a whole section of it is about abstinence only education. Yeah. And where you can find resources on this type of education. It also has like, another. Mm. very misleading stat in that let me find it real quick because it was another one that i was like what where they talk about um condoms and they say Mm -hmm. oh of 100 women whose partners always use condoms about 12 will become pregnant during the first year of typical use if the condom is is used correctly no no okay you're (laughs) Okay, there's two different stats about condoms, typical use and correct use, right? So if the condom is Mm -hmm. used correctly, it's 2%. That's the failure rate. If Mm -hmm. it's, she's right that typical use is higher, but then don't add if the condom is used correctly. That's, 
not typical <laughs> use. That's the whole point, that typically people screw up using condoms. That it, <laughs> you've, made, you've made the statistic completely, like, nonsensical. You're talking about, again, about two different things in the same stat. What? Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of fear-mongering about yes teen pregnancy towards the end of this book where I think she throws out another stat too. Like there's a, there's a Q and a in the back of the book. Cause she's like, well, my friend that said that she got pregnant, even though she and her boyfriend didn't really have sex. Um, and, um, she's like, yes, all it takes is one single tiny sperm to wiggle its way up into your uterus for you to become pregnant. And you should, you know, just stay away from penises forever. <laughs> <laughs> Which like, I it's mean, like as, as that whole terrible pregnancy arc on Scrubs taught us, that is a thing. But like, you need to present this information in a responsible way. Right. I really enjoyed the fact that even in the Q and A section, she was still making up teenagers because all of these questions <laughs> are like supposedly from real teenagers. Like, there's a, a two questions that go, "But I don't want me and my kid to have to live with my mom and my second stepdad." So she's like invented this character asking these questions. <laughs> and then the next one is, well, if that's the only way, I guess I'll just have to get mom and Jeffrey to go in and get the benefits for me. Like, <laughs> mom and Jeffrey. who's Jeffrey? Why are you inventing? Why are you inventing Jeffrey. these characters for this Q&A? Just present it as questions and answers. We don't need a detailed backstory about the life of these Listen. children asking these questions. And Dr. B. Sparks, she started making out characters and she just doesn't know she how to stop. stop. She doesn't she know how to get stop. out of this fantasy world she's created for herself in her mind. It's oh, very man. sad. Did we did sad. we tell or did we wrap up what actually happens to no. Annie at the end of this book? <laughs> no, so Annie's mom invites a priest over for dinner or something. As someone some <laughs> some old man involved with their church. And he doesn't outright ask them to give the baby up for adoption but he like heavily implies that he's like i've known this very beautiful couple and i conveniently have a picture of them and they've been trying for the past seven years to have a child but what a shame they just they just haven't been able to have a child but but you have a child and, and oh and I'm you sure... have this extra baby lying around yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> somehow annie puts a and b together and it's like oh i think he wants me to give them the baby for adoption and after a lot of wishy-washy back and forth she does end up giving the baby to the this couple her mom gets a new job upstate they move away the end i'm pretty sure nothing is ever done about annie's depression the end <laughs> and nothing is done about danny and the fact that he raped a kid multiple times oh yeah and i'm sure he goes on to rape another day totally totally awesome <laughs> yay so ah god i really i hated this book with every fiber of my being i really it was really painful i ugh, (laughs) it was just gross it was it just left me feeling very i don't yeah like you said gross i just had a very gross feeling very unsettled very just mm, yeah mm, because it was it was um yeah it's like it's just reading propaganda that kind mm-hmm. of has a plot, but I don't care about the plot at all, and the characters are boring and stupid. So it's not even good propaganda, <laughs> right? It's not even good propaganda. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna give me some propaganda, make it good propaganda. <laughs> well, it's over with. <laughs> Did you? Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask if there was absolutely anyone or anything in this book that you could relate to. I had a couple that, as I was reading, I was like, okay, this is gonna be my one but then either they didn't really show up again or they weren't you know so i guess Mm -hmm. of the characters in this book the one i most related to was annie's grandma (laughs) because she just lives in a cabin in the woods and doesn't have to deal with any of this shit (laughs) and is like uninterested in her grandchild as i was Mm -hmm. um so yeah i guess annie's grandma (laughs) Seems like she's probably, she's well out of she it. She don't care. Although she does have to put up with her dumb son living with her, and he seems like a real dud. Yeah, so. he probably te- he probably tells oh. her to stop going to Sunday school. It's really rude. Yeah, yeah, which <laughs> it's kind of rude. How about you? Did you relate to anybody? <sighs> I mean, if I had to pick anyone, I'd probably say it was the diary, Daisy. But, like, <laughs> if you think about it too hard, though, it's like Annie's just talking to herself through her diaries and i don't want to say i relate to annie (laughs) yeah you relate to the tiny facet of annie's personality that called her on her bullshit Mm -hmm. 
but only occasionally <laughs> and mainly was disinterested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't care enough to take it any further. <laughs> Uh, which, like, I guess kind of brings me to my silver linings, which was, like, that there were some empowering messages in the book. Like, yeah. Annie's alter ego, Daisy, does say some things. And I'm like, yeah, every girl should hear that. Like, there's, you don't need him in your life. You don't need a man to define you when you're 14. You should, quote, unquote, flush him, as they <laughs> constantly say, say. In, instead of break up. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was kind of similar to my silver lining, which was, uh, yeah, that there were certain messages that I was like, okay, this is, if we're going to have propaganda, I'm okay with this message. Like the Mm -hmm. main one was with Tammy when they were talking about her being illiterate and how much Mm -hmm. that limited her and how, yeah, yeah, like they were, they were focusing on like the importance of literacy and this and that. I was like, okay, yeah, that's a good message, but also, I kind of feel that if you're talking about how important literacy is in a book, like probably the people that are reading the book are already <laughs> literate. Yeah. Maybe. I guess I guess it could be an audiobook situation, but I don't know if that was really big in the 90s. <laughs> like, <laughs> Think um, of all of the cassette tapes that this had to yeah. be held on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that there uh, were there and again in between the very abstinence pushing mm-hmm. message, there were, right. yeah, there were certain, you know, things about sex that, which is the thing, like, I don't disagree with the abstinence only education, or I don't agree with the abstinence only message in total. There are good things in it, like, hey, you need to be careful about this. And if you, and in this book, even mm-hmm. they say, you know, if you are going to be sexually active, here are the types of things that would work mm-hmm. or not that would work, but that, um, you should like, here's, you know, you should use a condom to prevent STDs and you should look into getting, you know, birth control shots or an implant, you know? Uh, so mm-hmm. I appreciated that it wasn't a hundred percent abstinence only. It was just very much pushing that. But it did, yeah, it yeah. did at least acknowledge that some kids who are reading this might get the abstinence thing and be like, no, not for me. I'm going to have sex anyway. And gave them options. You know, it wasn't, it mm, wasn't. Yeah, there were some resources. Yeah, it wasn't entirely closed off to reality in that sense, where mm-hmm. a lot of abstinence heavy messages tend to be. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think it, it was definitely very ha- heavy handed in some aspects, but she did kind of say at the end, well, to be fair, other people, not everyone's going to agree. So here are some things that you right. can do. Um, I just, mm, yeah, it was just very hard for me, I guess, to see, to see around all of that. And yeah, mm. it's like, if you like scrape out the 18 layers of absolute garbage, there's kind of a mm-hmm. good foundation underneath, but there's 18 layers of garbage on top. So I don't want to have to scrape out those 18 layers yeah. of garbage, you know, I'd rather yeah. just read a book that doesn't have that. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, that would feel more realistic to what actual yeah. teenagers are thinking. <laughs> or how they talk, or how they act, or yeah. how they insult each other when they find out that their girlfriend is pregnant. You duhhead. Oh, man. <laughs> you boob tube. <laughs> God. Good time slide. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking good time slide. Oh my god. Oh man. Uh, so besides literally anything else in the entire world, <laughs> what would you rather be reading than this book? Um, it's actually really funny because for one of my classes this semester, the first book that we're reading actually had a lot to do with the themes that were in this book. Hmm. Yeah, it's called The Mothers by Britt Bennett. And oh, I've heard of this book. Yeah, it's really good so far. I saw it I'm on your coffee table. It. Oh yeah, because all of my all of my books for class were over there. That's oh, where you heard. That's where I've heard of it. Uh, but yeah, it's like about this girl in this kind of religious community, and she gets pregnant. And unlike Annie, she has an abortion, and it's dealing with kind of the fallout of the relationships of that. And it's very concerned with um, kind of the relationships between like mothers and daughters because her own mother committed suicide and she feels like somewhat guilty for that because she feels like she trapped mm-hmm. her mother in this um, like dead end life. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it also deals a lot more with the guy's side of it and um, his whole 
like situation where he feels like he didn't really have a choice in it. Like he helps or he gets his parents to pay for the abortion and he feels like this guilt about it because he never really came to turn. Anyway, it's, it's really good. I'm not all the way done with it yet. So it could Uh still turn out bad, but it's also interesting because like this book, it is presented in an interesting, well, this book's not interesting, but it's presented in a (laughs) non like it's, you know, this book has the the structure of the diary, right? So the the mother's uh-huh. is structured as most of the chapters begin in a first person plural voice where it's this group of mothers at the church, mothers and grandmothers at the church. Oh. And they're talking about this whole incident and everything that happened from it as like oh, gossip. Oh, that's really so cool. So it's like this, yeah. So it's like this really interesting structure and it's dealing with a lot of the themes that this book deals with, but actually dealing with them and not just spouting the author's own beliefs <laughs> yeah yeah huh i'm gonna have to pick that one up that yeah it's really, really good. good i'll let you know if it if it ends well or not but so far i'm i'm about halfway through and i'm really enjoying it um nice. and i was juggling this book and that book this week so that's definitely what i would rather have been reading <laughs> yeah <laughs> how about you <laughs> i um Went for a book. I actually haven't read this in many, many years, but, um, and I know you've probably read it too and loved it, but Angus Thongs and Full Frontal Snogging by Lynn I actually Renison. have never read that. You've never read it? I've oh my never God, read it. It's so good. It's so good. Oh, it's, it was... um, if you're looking for a realistic portrayal of a teenager's diary who is meeting a boy that she really loves for the first time and is maybe not the right boy for her, um, in my opinion, anyway, from these <laughs> books, um, definitely check out Angus Fox's full frontal Songing. It's fucking hysterical. Cool. But yes, you need to read them. I can't believe I know. I should. I can't believe. You're like it, right up your alley. I know. It was like it was one that I always saw, like when I was like going to the library to get books as a teenager, and uh, mm-hmm. I just I think I can't remember why I didn't read them. I think I was uh, I don't know. I was yeah. I don't know. I'll have to look, check it out now that I'm an adult and not yes, the target too. audience anymore. <laughs> I think it'll I think it'll still provide some pretty good entertainment okay. from what I can cool, remember. Cool, cool. Yeah. I'll add They're it to very my, funny. My list. Yeah. All right. So I think that about did you have anything else you want to talk about with this book? Oh, no, just that no one I would not recommend this book to anyone. No one should ever yeah, read it. No, don't read this. And um usually I am kind of like, oh, you know, the the author tried and the author had good things too. No, don't read this. Mm-hmm. It was no, trash. Don't. Yeah. Don't. Please don't. just throw Stay it away. away. If it. you see a copy of it, just throw it away. Just, I don't yeah, care if it's at like, the library. Just throw it away. <laughs> it's gross. Uh, like, Go Ask Alice is on the list of books that get banned a lot. Mm-hmm. And if it's anything like this, uh, yeah, no, I agree. I'm not for That's banning probably books, fine then. But that one I'm fine <laughs> with. Like, yeah, ban this. It's terrible. It's so We're terrible. We're willing to censor this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to forego my uh, strongly held beliefs to say that, yeah, this should be censored. No one should read this. It's terrible. <laughs> I will go Fahrenheit 451 on this book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I think it is your turn to pick a book. Oh, yes. Lay it so, on me. <laughs> um, I've chosen for our reading pleasure this fortnight, the first book in a fantasy romance series. Ooh. <laughs> Hocus Pocus by Teresa Roblin. Okay. Let me read you the Goodread synopsis. Great. Go for it. Shy and quiet Amanda Santarelli is unhappy watching the world go by around her. When her well-meaning but wacky aunt casts an assertive spell on her, Amanda's orderly world is turned upside down. Unable to control herself, Amanda blurts out whatever is on her mind every time someone (laughs) asks her a question. With no control over her own mouth, it's only a matter of time before her boss discovers her secret. (laughs) Mark Avid is happy with the way his unassuming assistant runs his office, but all of a sudden she's become a new person, both in attitude and appearance, and he's not sure he likes the effect on his orderly work routine. With each passing day, he finds himself waiting to see what will come out of her mouth next. Before long, he can no longer deny the truth. The new Amanda is seriously making him reconsider his vow never to mix business with pleasure. (laughs) Mark doesn't know if it's love or if he's just a victim of hocus pocus. (laughs) Okay, here's the thing. Maybe it's because this book was so awful, but I am into this book so far. Like, this sounds great. (laughs) This sounds really good. 
we'll there's see. no pregnant teenagers i'm into it um wait till you see the cover <laughs> oh no and i don't know i guess Teresa roblin it says the cover of the book says Teresa Roblin, award-winning author. Let's see what award she won. But it's got a pretty low rating on Goodreads, so okay. don't get your hopes up too high. Oh, I just looked at the cover. <laughs> I just looked at the cover. Oh, that is yeah. That is it's some pretty great good. Photoshop skills. All right, well, I am looking forward to it. Yeah, see it should be goes. good. <laughs> um, I mean, the rating might only be so low because not many people have read it, but... <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll love this and we'll be able to introduce Teresa Roblin to our giant audience of four people. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully it'll just be as awful as everything else we've read on the show. Yeah, that seems like <laughs> the most likely outcome. <laughs> uh, I just like the idea of an assertive spell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds a lot like... um. What was that movie that came out a while ago? Uh, yes, Man? Is that it? Where he has to just yeah. say... Uh, no, there's, a, be... there's a lot of movies there's with this There's a few game. where the premise is like, oh, he has to say yes to everything. Or, oh, he has to tell the truth. What's the one where they have to tell the, tr- the truth? Liar, the liar with liar, Jim liar. Carrey. And, uh, I, and think it's pro- I think Yes, Man is the one you're thinking of. I was thinking of Ella yeah. Enchanted. Oh, but yeah. That's... But that book is amazing and mm, let's read that book the for this movie show is terrible. Time. let's read Ella Enchanted I love that book yeah I fucking love Ella Enchanted uh, except that's so like good. the exact opposite of this because she has to do everything that everybody tells her mm, but she can't be assertive yeah right because she's opposite. under a spell <laughs> but the spell is the opposite <laughs> she needs an assertive spell <laughs> she needs the assertive spell <laughs> oh Jesus well, if well, anyone wants to talk to us about If this any 14-year-olds listening want to tell us what the most recent pickup line they've had used on them is. Or if you if you want to send us excerpts of your diary from when you were the same age as Annie, yeah. um, please yeah. email us at hatereadcast at gmail.com. Or you can tweet at us uh, at hatereadcast on twitter yes we may or may not be on itunes at this point um i think we're still waiting to hear back about that no 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 i think they just hate us and are trying to ghost us until we go away i think that's the situation (laughs) but until then please subscribe on soundcloud (laughs) follow us and like those episodes because it really makes our day thank you to ben cope for our theme song it's fucking amazing and i think that's all is that all our credits i think that's it yeah i think so i think so in the words of Dr. Beatrice Sparks, I hope we'll continue to be best friends for life. She and her homely little baby and me with my beautiful one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Every fortnight here on Hate Read. Fuck, what do I say? Every fuck. <laughs> Every fuck. <laughs> Every fuck night. <laughs> You're on fuckery. World... Ever since we read that Anita Blake book, right. it's just gotten real sexy around here. <laughs> this is like a little TMI, but like, I definitely feel like I get really sweaty when I'm sitting here recording for some reason, and I'm wearing pants mm-hmm. today, and I'm like, no, I need to take these pants off, but like, that's also not an option. <laughs> Leave my pants on. Okay. Thank you for that. (laughs) Like, I mean, to be clear, usually I'm wearing a skirt, not like I'm sitting around recording pantsless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you never know either way.